So David, welcome to the Ride of Lettuce. Um, my name is Fox. Um, this is Eric and Ryan. And today's special guest is David Yun. Um, David, can you start by telling our viewers where they can find you on social media? Yeah, uh, well, first, thank you for having me, guys. Um, wonderful experience. Uh, yeah, uh, my YouTube channel is named called Messy Room New Sesh. Um, and the doc uh, short documentary uh, about the PRK is on that channel. Um, yeah, it's on YouTube. We'll, we'll link that in the description of the video. Yeah, too. highly recommend it. Great, fi great film, great work. Um, what, what inspired you to make this film? I, growing up um, as a Korean American uh, and also as a Korean in Korea, I immigrated from Korea to California when I was nine. And the only thing I ever heard about um, inter-Korean politics or North Korean in, in uh, particular in Korea and also in the Asian community in, in the US was terrible things um, that I honestly believed all myself too, like uh, North Korea executes 10,000 Christians for having a Bible or uh, North Korea pours molten lava down a disabled person's throat because he's disabled, you know, crazy, crazy stuff like that. All this cartoon um, stuff, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I actually believed all that and I used to get in arguments with my mom actually saying, you know, uh, she would try to tell me like, don't believe everything you see in the news. And I'll be like, how can you say that mom? North Koreans are barbarians. They, you know, they eat people and they shoot people for having a Bible and things like that. But um, I started doing a little bit more research actually after I met um, these political prisoners that are still remaining in South Korea. Uh, they, are, they are a group of old men. Um, now they, they're living collectively together. They were prisoners of war that were never released after the Korean War. So they, some of them originate from the South. They joined the uh, P, uh, Korean People's Army later when, they, uh, when the KPA pushed down to Seoul during the Korean War. Some of them originate from the North. But when I met them, I believe it was my junior year of high school, uh, summer, I met them and I with the expectation thinking, okay, they're North Korean, so they're probably like really weird or something like that, you know? Like mm -hmm. there's a reason why they went to prison. I didn't know anything back then. And then I, I met them and they, and they were the most angelic people I've ever, you know, I've, I've ever met in my life. And that's considering the fact that they've been in prison and tortured for over 30 years, um, 40 years for some of them. And after that, I really started thinking, okay, well, this doesn't really make any sense to me. Um, why would these people go to prison for decades um, just to not give up their beliefs or their allegiance. And that kind of made, started me thinking, okay, well, that has to be worth something looking into. And after that, I found that there are so many lies, so many, um, I, I think, purposely constructed lies about the DPRK. And I wanted to start with um, interviewing North Koreans living in the South um, to dispel some myths uh, coming straight from uh, people who lived in the North themselves. But most importantly, they're not paid. That's like, the difference between other North Koreans that we see on the media. They're paid a lot of dollars, but obviously people, I have no money to pay them, so they were not paid anything. Um, so I wanted to give people a, I guess, a perspective that I doubt they've seen elsewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and um, it, it's really well done, and we can't recommend your film enough. Again, the uh, the name of the film is Loyal Citizens of Pyongyang in Seoul. Um, so, David, you kind of touched on this just a little bit ago, but maybe we can uh, go a little bit deeper because we often hear in the U.S. corporate media that the DPRK is one of the one of the top human rights abusers in the world and that the people of the DPRK live under a strict authoritarian government and that, the and that political rights don't exist there. But how does this compare to the reality on the ground? Definitely. Um, well, I think first things first, when we talk about um, the, the, the DPRK and human rights, um, the fact, fact is all these allegations come down to one thing, and which is the effect of testimonies. And this, um, can be found, uh, this is not just my speculation or anyone else's speculation, but when you look at U.S. sanctions on North Korea because of human rights, when you look at U.N. sanctions to uh, North Korea for human rights, they all say 
this research was based on defective testimonies. And I've looked at, um, you know, files from the UN and US and they all match the same thing uh, in comparison to, for example, when we look at Myanmar and uh, I believe it was 2018 when um, the UN sanctioned Myanmar for human rights abuses. When you look at their methodology behind um, the, uh, the sanctions, it says, you know, things like cross-referenced evidence, photos, videos, audios, testimonies. But when it comes to the DPRK or North Korea, it's always one thing. It's always um, defective testimonies. And so that's the first thing that I think everyone has to, I think, realize when it comes to any um, alarming things we hear about North Korea is that it's all based on something that we cannot possibly verify in any way. So now when we say things about on the ground, I think, um, of course, right, unless you go and, you know, see for yourself, of course, that might not be, you know, um, not may not be the most convincing thing unless you go there and see for yourself. But there are, I think, plenty of evidence to support that um, the reality in North Korea is completely different from um, what we hear. Um, for example, um, there are some very easy, easy to identify things. Um, for example, people say, uh, defectors say, we, they can't watch Disney movies or any Western movies for that in general. But there are plenty of pictures of children with like Mickey Mouse backpacks or, um, you know, there's like uh, video and DVD stores, um, pop-up stores that have a bunch of like action movies from the U.S., Hollywood movies and things like that. Um, and there are churches, there are mosques, there are temples in North Korea um, that I think people just say, well, they're just fake or they are actors. You know, for example, let's say if there are parishioners in a church, they will say there's actors. And I remember um, my friend who actually of, of the, uh, in the PSL who actually visited the DPRK said, you know, if they are actors, then Hollywood better come and scout these people because they have to be the best actors on the planet. <laughs> you know, they're putting this act up 24 seven. They have to be really good actors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they better be so, getting yeah. paid a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. right. And on top of that, when the world accuses the DPRK of, you know, you know, starving its citizens, saying they're extremely poor, well, if you're extremely poor, you're not going to erect fake churches and hire, you know, <laughs> fake actors when supposedly you can't feed your own people. It, it just logically doesn't make any sense. You touch in your documentary about how, um, about the famine, and food shortages in the um, in the DPRK after the collapse of the USSR. I was wondering if you could kind of elaborate on that and maybe give um, a bit more detail. Definitely, yeah. Uh, famine, um, I think, is one of the huge topics when it comes to North Korea or socialist countries in general. Um, now, North Korea in particular actually was doing better um, economically than South Koreans, which is something that I think I think people have a hard time believing. But until the '80s. North Korea was actually not only competing, but doing better than South Korea. Um, and in the 90s, like you mentioned, the Soviet Union collapsed. And on top of that, North Korea was hit in 1996 and 1997, the worst floods and droughts back to back. Um, I believe more than a century, uh, like, you know, um, the worst uh, disasters recorded in the past century. And on top of these things, um, the US was still sanctioning North Korea and at, even at that point, North Korea was still the most sanctioned country in the world. And so on top of these things, when um, people say that North Korea starved its own citizens, it's actually more plausible to say that it's amazing how North Korea actually made it out of the famine uh, without crumbling. And I think that's very, really owed to um, the unity that is demonstrated by the people and also the leadership. When you have something, when you when a country strained that much, when hundreds of thousands of people actually do die, it takes a lot of trust um, from the people to the leadership, and a lot of credibility that the leadership must have built from the people already. So when people talk about the famine, um, I think it's really important to understand that this was not some socialist failure, but in in fact, it it must be a socialist accomplishment. Because if the DPRK was not a socialist country, by the time these floods and sanctions and droughts happened, I don't think the DPRK would have been around right now. I mean, even when you look at the United States right now with the coronavirus, we're not doing too hot, right? And we're supposed to be the most technologically advanced country in the world. We're supposed to be the most medically advanced country in the world, but we're doing the worst, right? 
So I think when we talk about the famine, it's actually the opposite. The, the conclusion should be the opposite, that it was an effort uh, by the people and the leadership to climb out of the famine and survive to what the DPRK is now, rather than saying this was a socialist failure. Um, Kim Il-sung starved his own, I'm um, not Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il starved his own people and whatnot. Yeah. Right, and it's always so disingenuous when that claim is made about any uh, U.S. adversary. Like they say the same thing about Venezuela, um, but totally whitewash the impact that U.S. sanctions have on the country. Um, but yeah, so you begin your film by pointing out that in order to understand um, South Korean politics, we must understand the National Security Act. Um, so I'm wondering if you can tell us a little more about that and why it's relevant today. Definitely. Um, National Security Act um, is ex extremely fascist and primitive law that you would not expect in a developed country like South Korea. And again, I, want, I really want to point this out because when people talk about the two Koreas, it seems to be South, good, advanced, right. North, bad, uh, primitive. But when you look at the national security law, we have cases of just recently in 2019, I believe it was late 2019, we had a teacher, um, a primary school teacher, who was sentenced to prison for having the autobiography of Kim Il-sung. And this is in 2019, right? When, when this, seems, this seems like this was something that happened in, let's say, Nazi Germany or something. But no, this happens in the de developed um, big economy country of South Korea. We have um, someone that was indicted for complimenting Pyongyang beer, saying it tastes good. We have someone, because in, in the law itself, it spells out anything, whether monetary value or anything that can benefit. And it's vague on purpose because you can spin it any way you want. You can say, me commenting online saying Pyongyang beer tastes good, benefits North Korea. And if anything benefits North Korea, I can be put to prison. That is in the print of the law itself. And this not only restricts people from even talking about North Korea, but the National Security Act has been used also for uh, against protests against the U.S. occupation or in earlier times against the, uh, the, the, the dictatorships. Anything can be spun, for example, if you step out of line of the U.S. occupation or if you want to step out of line of the um, neoliberal regime, you can be charged and red baited from this law. Yeah, and um, it's it's like the official, like, I guess you could say religion of the South Korean government is, you know, anti-communist, anti-Pyongyang uh, uh, sentiment at all. It's just really, um, it's just really insidious. Because um, the unofficial religion here in the U.S. is anti-communism, so they have the same agenda. Um, so also in your film, um, Let's let's talk about how the um, NIS manufactures uh, spies um, bribe and coerce uh, false confessions. Um, maybe you can also talk about what goes on within these holding centers um, and how defectors are used as a political tool against the DPRK and reunification. Definitely, and I think I can connect this question to kind of what we're talking about just seconds earlier. When you talk to South Koreans, most of them, I can't give you a percentage because I don't know, but most of them will say, you know, uh, North Korea's bad or North Koreans are bad. Just in general, have a negative idea of North Koreans. But it's actually the complete opposite for North Koreans. When you ask them about South Koreans, they get extremely happy. They say, um, you know, they're, they are our, uh, you know, country men and women. Um, we really want to be reunited together. And it's really exemplified by even in the military. When you go to South Korean military, still to this day, the target dummies are North Korean uniforms. But when you go to North Korean military, the target, uh, target dummies are not dressed in South Korean uniform, but actually U.S. uniforms. So the enemy is portrayed in North Korea, not as South Koreans, but as the U.S. imperialists. Whereas in the South, the enemy is not obviously the U.S., but it's actually directed towards North and so that kind of connects to how um, the spies, right, N uh, NIS, which actually was like, called KCIA um, because it was actually founded by the K uh, CIA. They just renamed it a couple years ago to just make it look nicer. But it's right. it's the KCIA. <laughs> um, yeah, wow. actually, yeah. 
wow. I actually <laughs> I talked to the lawyer um, more um, outside of the interviews, and he walked me through a bunch of cases that he uh, worked on, and some of them are actually really ridiculous. Uh, one of them actually was charged uh, and prosecuted as a spy, and how that happened was um, when she first defected, they asked her, "Are you a spy?" She said, "No," and they said, "We don't believe you." And they put her in a lying detecting test, in a polygraph, and she passed the polygraph test. And and this passed under court. What I'm about to say actually passed in court. They said that North Korean scientists planted a pill in your bra that if you swallow it, you can pass a polygraph test. And that actually passed in court, and now she's in prison. And, and she, I think she got out, but she went to prison. So, Does that even exist? Is that is that a real thing that happens? That's some know, games, even, games yeah. or what is it? J, like a double seven bullshit. Yeah, it, I yeah. don't even know if such pill exists, to be honest with you. Um, but you know, saying that she hid it in her bra throughout her, you know, travel to south to the south, and throughout her detention, um, you know, period. I mean, it's just the entire thing is just ridiculous. But fact is, it worked and, you know, she was um, ruled guilty and as a spy and whatnot. But yeah, so the idea behind all these spy making is that we should constantly fear the North. We should constantly fear North Koreans. Even when I was in South Korea two years ago, I think it was the last time I was in South Korea. When you go on the subway, you'll see advertisements for clothing, for, you know, food, what have you. But you will also see KCIA posters saying if you see a suspected uh, spy, terrorist, call this number. And, of, and it's kind of given that this is directed towards North Koreans. Because, you know, when the, the word terrorism in, South, in Korea really only applies to North Koreans. Um, and another case I think that's really interesting, I'm not sure if you've heard about it, but during the 88 Olympics, a uh, South Korean airline commercial uh, flight was shot, uh, was bombed. And a North Korean defector said that she did it. And what's really interesting about this case is, I believe her name was Kim yeon I believe that was her name. She never went to prison and she actually married a KCIA agent. And so, you know, <laughs> wow. you, know you imagine, you imagine a, let's say the, you know, uh, FBI, I don't know who, arrested someone that was partaking in the 9-11 attacks, right? And this person not only doesn't go to prison, but marries a CIA agent, you know, it, it's pretty much the equivalent of that. It makes no sense. And, you know, she stepped forward and said, yes, uh, the North Korean government sent me to blow up this plane. Um, and I did it. North Korea sent me to do it. But she never went to prison. She lives in a luxury apartment right now with her KCIA husband. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, wow. these stories are very unbelievable. Um, they're very ridiculous. And it's almost as if they're not really even trying to make it look real. Uh, probably because it works, you know, it's, it's in the law. No one questions it. Cause if you do question it, you will go to jail. So it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's almost like a movie almost, but it's reality in South Korea. So, um, I showed a, I showed a friend of um, mine. Um, I showed a couple of friends actually, this documentary did loyal citizens of Pyongyang. And, um, one of my friends had a, you know, a difficult time, um, with it because, um, when you talk about like, oh, they're lying about human rights, you know, everyone's gut reaction like is like, oh my God, am I excusing genocide here? And nobody like wants to do that, right? <laughs> um, but her her question was, how how do they quantify these things? How mm-hmm. how is this how do I know this is real? How do I know who's telling me the truth? So I I guess on on behalf of people who want to know better um, how to read through the propaganda. Um, and and get a better analysis of the entire situation without necessarily um, denying or excusing human mm-hmm. rights, I, I guess, um, or without better words to say that. Mm-hmm. Um, um, how how can how can we find out about these stories and the research that goes into them? Where where can we read that information? Where can we quantify that? Definitely, for definitely. Our I think you know the. Um, Whenever my friends too, you know, I, I have friends that will come up, let's say that people that I knew from high school or people that I meet in college that say, you know, okay, things that you say seem interesting. Can you explain it to me? But the thing is to, you know, I guess to completely 
convince the person I really do need like two, three hours to talk about the entire <laughs> thing because historical context is so important. And, you know, um, to describe North Korean human rights, we really would have to go back all the way back to 1945 um, and, you know, and work our way upwards from there. But in terms of actual things that we can, resources, I would honestly say um, Bruce Cummings, even though I don't agree with everything that he says, I do respect and admire his work. He is one of the very few scholars in the U.S. that um, kind of fought against the dominant narrative that the North started the war or that, um, you know, the, the North is uh, trying to kill everyone in the world with their nukes and things like that. Uh, I, I think Bruce Cummings, um, I believe the book title is called The Korean War, A History. That one is uh, a very good starter, I believe. And <clears throat> this is a very big, I guess, commitment, but reading Kim Il-sung's autobiography is actually extremely helpful. I, I read that, uh, it's a very big read, but um, you know, even if you don't agree with everything that he says, if you are going to claim that you know a lot about North Korea, you can't really claim that unless you know what the, the first leader, the founder of the DPRK you know, said, right? And this, right. Has, this has nothing to do with whether you agree with him or not. But you can't see, you can't claim to know him or his policies or the you know the the state that or the party that he founded without actually knowing what he said himself. And so I would say, you know, you don't have to maybe read the whole book, but certain chapters or excerpts from his autobiography titled uh, "With the Century," I think is a very good uh, resource for a perspective. Yeah, um, actually, this is a great segue to one of our questions we have about that. So maybe you can. Um, Tell us a little more about uh, Kim Il Sung and the uh, Juche. Uh, I'm sorry, Juche uh, ideology mm -hmm. and um, how that got formulated and how, what it looks like today. But also, m maybe also break down how the actual government works there. Definitely. Um, one thing I guess I like to start with is. Um, there are more than one, so the, the um, most dominant party is the Workers' Party of Korea, but there are multiple other parties that get a fair vote and there are, uh, that started out decades ago and still exists today. Um, so there are multiple p political parties in North Korea. And um, kind of going back to Chuche, the idea of Chuche is that um, we are going to be self-reliant, right? We as a nation and also to the individual that the idea is that a person makes his own destiny or a state chooses its own path. And this stems from decades and really centuries of Korean history where Japan, China, Russia, and the US um, invaded over and over and over again uh, the Korean Peninsula. And the idea here is that we cannot make our own destiny. We cannot dictate our own terms and our own um, terms for survival or growth unless we have the means ourselves to one, defend ourselves with military strength and two, economic strength so that we can self-sustain ourselves. And so the idea of Chuche is that of, this doesn't mean that we do everything ourselves. Like a lot of scholars, and I really don't get how they're even called scholars, but they claim that Chuche is a very uh, faulty you know, idea because North Korea got aid from the Soviet Union got aid from China, and those, are, those things are all true, but the thing is North Korea never claimed to do everything uh, on their own power. And then North Korea never claimed that. That's a very ridiculous and impossible idea. The idea is that if I'm North Korea, I may receive aid from the Soviet Union or China, but that does not mean that I'm going to do what China wants me to do or what Soviet Union wants me to do. It means that the North Korean government is going to do with the money what is best for North Korean people, right? And so it doesn't mean that North Korea claims that they do everything themselves. Everything manufactured is by their own resources or their own technology. That doesn't, you know, that's not what it means at all. It means that whether it's our resources or it's someone else's resources that were given to us, we are going to do with it what we want and what we need to do for our country. That's what Chu Chen. There's, um, a really great book um, called Radicals on the Road by Judy Wu Chen. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, mm -hmm. um, but it's um, about 
this um, just group of academics who travel through socialist Asian countries. And I guess the, whole, the I think the whole thesis of the book is that Westerners kind of orientalize their mm -hmm. um, um, uh, East A Eastern Asian socialism. Um, but she she offers a really, really great um, perspectives and insights to um, like Vietnam, um, China, and in North Korea. And mm -hmm. uh, she gave an account on, on how, how um, school children learn how to make fabric out of like rocks. Mm. Um, and then make they can make like clothes out of it. And, Whoa. and, and they say like a third grader can explain to you how to do it Holy and it, it, it like blew my mind i, I was I, I, really I impressed i can barely put on a shirt and like <laughs> <laughs> yeah actually um I'm, I'm not sure if this was exclusive to the dprk but i do know that um that fiber you're referring to is actually called chuche fiber and uh, interestingly enough in north korea um uh, because of sanctions um North Korea could not come up with, and winters in North Korea get really harsh, very, very harsh. And um, the government did not have enough materials and uh, because only 15% of North Korean land is actually arable. So cotton is actually not a very abundant resource in North Korea at all. So clothing was a very, uh, it was an issue. And a scientist um, that actually defected to the North actually, um, Af after to the north yeah I, this is actually another interesting fact um, <laughs> when um korea was divided um by the u.s a lot of artists teachers academics um skilled professionals actually went to the north because they what? the yeah, people don't. Why would, uh, why would artists want to be in socialist countries? Why would yeah. teachers want to go to a socialist country? <laughs> right, right. It's, it's, it's something that I think also people kind of get um, shocked by, but it, it, the, it's because in the South, it was a police state. And that's not my words, it's actually the US's words that um, US soci sociologists and historians at the time described it as a police state huh. because um, people, I remember uh, I was talking to one of the uh, grandpas the, uh, that I met, North Korean grandpas, um, that was actually in Seoul during the occupation. And he was saying, you, actually, you couldn't stand um, in the street with more than two or three people mm. um, in a group together because then the U uh, US troops would come and disband you for possible you know, plotting a revolu uh, revolution, you know, protests and things like that. Um, that's just one example, of course. But yeah, and that's actually one of the reasons why the North Koreans, uh, uh, Workers' Party of Korea symbol has a paintbrush in the middle with a hammer and sickle uh, for um, artists and intellectuals, actually. Um, so yeah, so the scientist, I'm sorry, I, I went off on a tangent, but yeah, so the scientist, um, he developed a way how to make fiber out of coal, and, and coal is a abundant um, resource in North Korea. And so they figured out a way how to uh, manufacture clothing out of coal and distribute it to the people. And it was a huge success. And um, yeah, it's called Chuche Fiber because it was produced again, like with the mindset of, okay, we don't have, right? We don't have uh, cotton, but what we do have is coal. So how can we, right? With our resources, how can we benefit our people? So that's, yeah, really cool story, I think. And the individual can make it themselves. They know yeah, how to I, do I, it yeah. without the government. I never knew that. Oh. I knew that was even possible. That's crazy. <laughs> unbelievable because we, we're, we're kind of talking about media a little bit mm -hmm. i'm just curious if you've seen this film called a little pond a little pond i'm not sure i don't know the korean name but it's about the um the nogan re massacre oh yeah 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 i watched it yeah so um given that there's like this big conversation around human rights violations and i'm wondering if you could maybe touch on human rights violations in the South from the United States government? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Um, you know, I, what's interesting is we have um, no document, real verifiable documentation of North Korean human rights, right? When, um, when we see the news of supposed concentra concentration camps, these are all just aerial shots from satellite of a random building that, uh, 
no one has any idea what these are. And they mm-hmm. used to take a picture of a random building, maybe a farm, and say, look at that, that's a death camp. But other, on the other hand, we do have documented, um, very well documented cases of human rights violations. And I'll start with the, um, before Ndoganri, we had Jeju massacre, Jeju Island, where now um, we research found that we have upwards of 80,000 that were killed or went missing from the island, which is one third of the island's population. And this was a U.S. operation. And, you know, people can say that, well, it was South Korean authorities that did mainly the killing and things like that. That is true. But the weapons came from the U.S. And it was under... Um, they always come U- from the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and it was under the supervision and guidance of U.S. officers. And they had, a, the U.S. military had a title for it. It was called Operation Scorched Earth. Mm. It was uh, planned out by U.S. Um, military officials, and they took pictures of the massacres. And these pictures are in the National Archives in, in Washington, D.C. And so the U.S. cannot at all deny its role in the massacre because it simply could not have happened without the U.S. support, U.S. organization, U.S. weapons. Um, interesting little quip. Um, it, when you, if you guys have any South Korean friends, um, you might, you guys might have heard they have to go to military service for two years. And what's really interesting is, uh, let's say I'm in Seoul, right? My hometown is Seoul. If I get drafted for the military, I'm automatically stationed in a city far away from me. And that's actually a practice that started with the Jeju massacre because the policemen and the military uh, military station in Jeju Island refused to kill people on the island. Because if you think about it, these were men that grew up, right, with these, you know, village members and their family members. And they were like, why would I kill my own, you know, you know, townspeople. And so from then and on, the South Korean government decided to shift the boys going to the military to a city where they would be more likely to be okay with killing people there because people refused to kill their neighbors during the Jeju massacre. So that's actually something that even South Koreans today actually don't realize why they're going so far away from their family is because of the Jeju massacre, actually. Um, and yeah, after that, um, we have, of course, uh, the Milgunri massacre where U.S. troops literally just fired machine guns on villagers on below a bridge. And I believe uh, upwards of 2,000 people, something like that, died. And I've read some personal accounts, and it's truly gruesome. Um, and it's something that, of course, is not really publicized at all. Um, and on top of that, we have the firebombing in the north um, when the U.S. Air Force dropped more bombs in the tiny country. Korea already is small, but half of that in the north dropped more tons of bombs in that small plot of land than the entire Pacific theater in World War II. And every single city was leveled, and that's not an exaggeration. Every single city was leveled to the point where the U.S. Air Force said, we have no more targets, what should we do? And towards the ending, the, towards the later um, year, uh, year of the war, the U.S. Air Force started targeting dams and farms because they had no more targets left. And so the second biggest dam in the world actually was in North Korea after the Hoover Dam. And wow. that, that dam was bombed by the U.S. Air Force. There's pictures and documentation. And this ended up in, I believe, in U.S. estimation, the starvation of one to two million people. And this was all, again, recorded and publicized in uh, the U.S. Air Force uh, documents that I've read. And it was very, um, said very nonchalantly. It was like, yeah, we're going to starve out 1.1 to 2 million people. And uh, we're going to bomb this dam. And that's what's going to happen. Um, and not to mention, you know, napalm. Ma- uh, there's also a ma- another massacre as well, very well known in North Korea, a uh, Shincheon massacre, where uh, there's, they still find bones in the land. Um, they are, there's bones with their skulls found with nails stuck through them. Um, there are bones of children found inside burnt huts and things like that. Um, so yeah, the U.S. really has no claim on human rights whatsoever. Um, and this is not only Korea, right? Every single place that the U.S. military has touched on exactly. has, has blood sprayed everywhere. Right. from US bombs and bullets and this is not only Korea but you know, I'm like, still dealing with Asian orange no like let's be honest exactly honest. right right there's still bombs and mines being blown up on random civilians in Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia I've been to Cambodia and I've seen 
amputees everywhere from um, when they accidentally stepped on a mine that was placed by the U.S. military, things like that. So yeah, human rights is yeah. U.S. has no claims on human rights whatsoever. It's not a Western capitalist value, that's for damn sure. And the the U.S. empire runs on blood. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Just curious about the uh, you you mentioned that obviously the U.S. has committed heinous crimes against um, the people on the Korean Peninsula and, um, and uses that human rights discourse, discourse to um, advance its like imperial claims on these places. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering about um, today how uh, the U.S. occupation of the Korean Peninsula um, plays, how it plays a role in this um, new push for a Cold War with China, which obviously is um, fueled by this weaponization of human rights discourse. Um, and I'm just curious to hear um, to hear you break down how how the Korean Peninsula fits into that. That's, that's a very relevant question right now. Um, something that I guess I would start with is uh, that continues on the from previous question is the Gwangju massacre of 1980 where a bunch of students and workers were protesting against the um, dictatorship and the special forces, um, South Korean special forces that were dispatched by a US general at the DMZ um, was dispatched to the city and they massacred over 2000 people. And this was at the command and permission of the US generals. And now declassified CIA files show that not only they knew this was going to happen, they provided air support. They gave them helicopters. They gave them satellite images of the protesters from um, gunships uh, in, the, in the sky. And so when it comes down to mobilizing the South Korean military on behalf of the you know, US imperialist goals, not only is it possible it has happened a lot before i mean even let's look at vietnam right what were what were south koreans doing in vietnam fighting vietnamese people right it was on behalf you know at the request of not even request it, the u.s has operational control over south korean military which is something that i don't even know if south koreans realize themselves but in wartime it's actually not president moon that would have operational control over south korean forces it, it would be actually be president trump so um in terms of mobilizing the South Korean uh, military and the population for U.S. goals, I would say it's definitely been some, something that has been demonstrated before, something that definitely should be avoided in, in the coming, um, you know, in the coming times. But something that really is cause for concern is also um, Status of Forces Agreement, SOFA, which um, says that if a U.S. soldier commits a crime like rape or murder, it's not dealt with U, uh, South Korean courts, but actually under um, U.S. martial military martial law, and this has resulted in multiple rapists and murderers going away scot free and just being stationed in Japan instead. For example, in 2006, a tank ran over two middle school girls, um, and they, the two uh, drivers, the mil, uh, soldiers, they were just stationed in Japan. They got away scot free, oh and um, I believe, I forget the exact statistic, but uh, rate of rape around U.S. bases in Korea, I think it's up more than 100% more than the average rate in, in the country. But again, it's, um, yeah. And the that land. Is yeah. Horrible. That's horrible. We literally overthrew the Lib Libyan government and we used, like, the, we were like, oh, Gaddafi's using rape as a weapon of war. We've got to take Viagra. him out. Right, right, right. Gaddafi's giving his soldiers Viagra. Ah, that's just maddening. That's 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 horrific. Empire projecting yeah. itself yeah. again. All of those babies that are born. I mean, there's like. <laughs> yeah, I, that's it's it's. Are they American? Terrible. Are those kids American citizens? Like, how does that? Um, no, I I don't think so at all. I mean, I don't see why any U.S. soldier would take responsibility for impregnating you know, their rape victim at all. Say that again? Um, say that again? I, I, I don't see any reason why a U.S. soldier would take responsibility for 
Why? Why is that? Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> actually, because the law allows them to. Actually, because of the uh, status of force agreement, the law allows them. The agreement between the U.S. and South Korea allows them to walk away scot free from running over two girls with a tank, raping uh, women, um, you know, getting drunk and running over people with their cars. Uh, these things happen all the time. And um, on top of that, um, the biggest overseas U.S. base in the world. So aside from U.S. mainland, the biggest U.S. military base in the world is actually in Pyeongtaek in South Korea. Mm. It's, um, it's massive. And the address actually is California. It's not Korea. So when you, if you want to mail something, <laughs> if you want to mail something, the address is California. It's not in Korea. So essentially what's happening is the South Korean government literally gives free land to the military. So how can you call yourself a sovereign country? South, South Korea is not a sovereign country at all. It literally gives colonial land project to of the, the West. Military. It's a colonial project of the West. It's like, it's like Israel. Israel is like the largest military base in the Middle East. It's, yeah, then, that, that that story you just you just told us about about how the um, how they just like run over um, people and not be you know prosecuted or have any any mm -hmm. kind of uh, rectifying actions taken against them kind of reminds me of like the IDF and what uh, Israel does to Palestinians but also U.S. citizens like Rachel Corey what was ran over by a bulldozer and she's a U.S. citizen but nothing happened about that. So it was just a really tragic thing. So they kind of mimic each other, these colonial projects. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I was um, charging, uh, switching my port charge. But yeah, definitely. I think, you know, like, like you said, um, and like we talked about before in Vietnam, case of Korea, um, it's not unique, right? It's imperialism, it kind of shows its face um, everywhere in a similar fashion with blood, like you said, Eric. Um, and there is no accountability. There's no accountability from when the uh, powerful imperialist soldiers rape or kill. Um, there's no punishment. There's no one keeping track. And that's, and that's because Korea doesn't have control over its military. The United States has control over its military. Mm -hmm. Where can we read about that? Um, well, it's, I imagine if you just search it on Google, it's probably there, because uh, it's not a very hidden fact, right? It's a, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it it's never not, is. It's never is. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. like right there in your face, right? Yeah. Um, and during the Korean War too, also, the South Korean military was not under control of uh, President Ri. It was under MacArthur, mm -hmm. um, which is why the armistice was not signed between the DPRK and ROK. It was the DPRK and the U.S., which is why the peace treaty that you know we all want cannot be signed between the U.S. and oh, I'm sorry between North Korea and South Korea. It has to be between the U.S. and North Korea. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's a completely different topic. You know, President Moon and his policy. That's a completely different topic. But yeah, I mean, not at all. Yeah, the so I guess the conclusion is unless the U.S. occupation in South Korea ends, there cannot be peace in Korea. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious because today we in the U.S. really only hear about the DPRK um, when it when there's a story that goes viral about some cartoonish lie like um, that they found a, a unicorn there or something um, mm -hmm. or or um, a conversation about nuclear weapons. Um, so I would love to hear you um, explain mm -hmm. to the audience why um, the DPRK um, acquiring a nuclear capability or developing a nuclear capability is actually a rational decision and not this um, irrational move that we're constantly being worried about. Um, nuclear weapons, I think first um, we have to acknowledge that the only country that's ever used nuclear weapons is um, I'm, I'm sorry, did it? Okay. It is the United States, right? Mm -hmm. And... On Asians. Yeah, right, exactly, on Asians. <laughs> and um, during the Korean War, the U.S. actually was contemplating using atomic weapons. And um, the U.S... I'm sorry, this is the camera key? Okay. And the U.S. made 
uh, dummy practice runs with dummy bombs, uh, practice uh, bombs on, uh, on, uh, on, in, in North Korea with uh, bombers. And um, that's actually a lot of the reason why a uh, huge uh, influx of uh, migrants went down to the South. Um, and the South likes to spin it like, oh, they came because they knew North was bad and South was good. That's not the case. It's because every inch of the land in the North was getting firebombed, napalmed, and possibly nuked. So, you know, if you are a villager, you're, you're not going to stay because it's just so dangerous for you. So um, not only was the U.S. contemplating using nuclear weapons during the Korean War, after the armistice agreement, which... Um, restricts new weapons being introduced to the peninsula the u.s installed by the uh by 19 i believe 90 it was um over 2,000 nuclear warheads stationed along the dmz and so and this was when north korea had zero nuclear weapons and so from north korea's perspective you have a country that one used nuclear weapons actually and two invaded your country three said they're going to use it four actually brought nuclear weapons for decades in, on your front lawn, right? And so it, it makes the only solution to that is to develop your own nuclear deterrent. Otherwise, you are completely vulnerable to being invaded at all times. And an invasion from the US is not a slight possibility. It's the only possibility and the only reality for North Korean citizens. And the US- um, It's already has, happened. We've right. already invaded South Korea. That's what. There's only right. one Korea, <laughs> only exactly. one. <laughs> exactly. right. right. And you know, not only has the U.S. already had invaded Korea. Um, when we look at the classified files now, like in 1996, the U.S. draws up war plans for another invasion. Um, and and it's interesting because 1996 was actually when North Korea was about to right collapse, right, because of starvation. And so that's another sick practice and thinking um, from the U.S. part. Pretty much went okay people are starving let's invade now that's that's another um little side quip but yeah so from um north korea's perspective it, it made no sense to not develop nuclear weapons um and that's actually another uh interesting uh historical example because when north korea started wanting to develop nuclear weapons the soviet union said um that don't develop nuclear weapons, we will instead protect you with our nuclear umbrella. But, you know, um, from the North Korean perspective, the really the best way, the only sure way to defend yourself is not have someone have pulled the gun for you, but for you to be holding the gun yourself, right? And so that's when North Korea started developing weapons. And despite decades of sanctions and sanctions, um, with the new launch of Hwasong-15, uh, North Korea, uh, prove to the world that their ICBM now can reach um, Washington as far as Washington DC now. And while that might be alarming to the average American, it's like, oh my God, North Korean missiles can now reach us. Um, one, North Korea has absolutely no reason to start a war with the United States, right? Uh, the United States has nuclear warheads stationed in Guam, in Japan, that can, with a push of a button, can obliterate the entire peninsula in a couple minutes. Yeah. And North Korea has no reason to start a war with the greatest military force the world has ever seen. In fact, it's amazing that this, despite the sanctions, now the tiny country now can say to the U.S., you pretty much, you can't fuck with us anymore, right? Like, I have the exact same thing you have. Um, and also, you know, when people get scared that, the, that North Koreans have an ICBM, I think they also forget that the U.S. have had the ICBM for decades now. Um, and they are stationed thousands. in thousands, thousands, thousands of them, right? Thousands and thousands of them. And not only are they in the United States, they're stationed in Triton submarines all across the world. They are in every single ocean, yeah. every inch of the world, and they can be launched from a submarine at any given point. So the threat is more real for North Koreans yes. than Americans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and they're already kind of de facto at war with the United States because we're controlling their military. So we're at like North and South Korea aren't at war. They're at war with the United States. Exactly. Yeah. And there hasn't been a treaty. And just what, one or two years ago, absolutely ridiculous, John Bolton um, threatened the Libya mob. Exactly. Um, which he was referring to the fact that Libya gave up its 
um, capabilities and then look what's happened now. They assassinated NATO forces, helped assassinate um, their leader, and now the state has fully collapsed. Um, so, so yeah. I, 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 it's a slave market. Right. Yeah, I just, just think like that it's really, it's really um, absurd how much we're fear-mongered about, especially us on the West Coast, um, constantly getting these alerts on our phones saying like, oh, they can reach Seattle now. And it's like, who's really threatening who? The context right. is always, always removed. And I think that you just did a really good job breaking down the historical context and um, putting putting that power um, imbalance that the media tries to erase um, under the spotlight. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, I, I don't wanna switch gears um, all that much, but I, you, you also mentioned in your film, the think tanks that sponsor uh, the uh, defectors um, in South Korea and the United States, the, the one you point out is called the Atlas Network, uh, which is known for, which is also known for meddling in Latin American politics. And we've been seeing that very recently, um, especially in Bolivia and Venezuela. Um, what's the connection between funding uh, the uh, defector testimonies and regime change in Latin America? Definitely. Um the main exposure and main, like most of the exposure that the average person can possibly have on North Korea is from defectors. And so what happens is these defectors are now weaponized. And how are they weaponized? They are paid a ridiculous amount of money to go in front of a camera and say a bunch of things that will not and cannot be verified in any way. And so these uh, instruments of, um, these. Uh, instruments of war are carried out by organizations like the Alice Network and also um, NED, um, mm -hmm. National Endowment for Democracy. Um, I mean, NED's, NED's been doing terrible shit for um, <laughs> like so many other countries too. Um, mm -hmm. And Hong Kong, yeah. they're involved with Hong Kong. Yeah, definitely, Hong Kong is a big one right now, definitely. Um, and you know, what's actually interesting um, that I, I wish I would have included in, in, the, in the documentary is that for defectors, when they come to the South, um, a lot of them have the expectation that, okay, I'm going to make a lot of money and I'm going to go back. Um, but reality is you, you can't go back. And they are told in the North, if you go, you, you can't come back. But some of them, you know, still end up going. Um, or some of them are straight up as kidnapped, like, you know, like the waitresses that, um, that I okay. featured on my documentary. But when you go there, uh, defectors are ex uh, discriminated very heavily. And they, the, works that, the work that they're given are the, the lowest of the lowest, the most physically demanding, the most mm -hmm. demeaning work. And so oftentimes the only, the, um, the only opportunity for a lot of defectors to make some real cash is by giving these ridiculous testimonies um, even though they might have zero interest in politics even though they probably know they're lying through their teeth a lot of times maybe they're facing homelessness or something like that they a lot of them might be you know just forced to do those kind of things um, I don't know you know to what percent this is the case but it is a fact that a lot of defectors are marginalized they live in the they below they, they live below the poverty line and also that um, an opportunity for them to make some real cash is by being a celebrity defector is what they're called. So yeah, they really are, their words are really weaponized in the media because if you really do talk to the average American and you ask them about North Korea and you really get to asking them, well, what gave you those opinions? They'll probably tell you, well, did you not see like North Korean defectors on you know the news telling us these stories? And I mean, if you do think about it from the average perspective, you really have no reason to question what they're saying, right? I mean, when you plaster the words human rights or, you know, refugee, these are very hard, you know, emotional words that kind of draw the uh, emotions of the audience. And you really have no reason to question it because they're not coming from a political, they don't seem like they're coming from a political standpoint. Mm -hmm. But behind the scenes, they really are coming from a, um, really uh, cash motivated right, right. political machinery. So, so um, how can 
how can we, I guess this goes back to what I asked earlier, like what, what resources could we use to, to talk to our friends about this? How can we say, hey, these people are getting money to fabricate their experience just so that they can survive? How can we quantify that for, for people who are willing to, to hear us out and listen to us about this? Definitely. Um, with, you know, with the wonder, uh, wonderful tool of Google. <laughs> the Google machine. <laughs> <laughs> Easel, you can easily find statistics on uh, what percentage of defectors live in poverty. You can also find how much money they can earn by doing different interviews. For example, like the most arguably the most famous one, uh, what's your name? Pac. Yeah. Pac. Pac. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know what? I, I, I don't even bother remembering her name because she's just trash. But she, <laughs> you know, she. <laughs> <laughs> she, yeah, her agent admitted that she makes around fifty to sixty thousand dollars on one campus tour. Wow! Right, so that's a lot of money. That's someone's sal annual salary right there, made on one day, just telling she's lies like, about. She's like Hillary Clinton. It, yeah, exactly. She yeah, changes I, her story. I, I think almost every other interview I, I hear with her, yeah. her story is is different. Her story and like when they, there's one where they trip her up on it, and she's like, "What?" And it was like something about her dad. And and they were like, oh, I thought I thought you buried him alive, but now it's he's like the incubator not, not story. Him. Right, yeah. right. It's the incubator story. <laughs> You've got the incubator, incubator stories. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Yeah, she changes stories. Like I, you know, you would imagine if your only job is to lie, at least do a good job of lying, right? Like at least keep your story straight. But it looks like she can't keep her story straight. I mean, it, it's I did not it, have it, a sexual it's a tough job. Job. It's a tough <laughs> job. That's why she gets paid so much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a lot of work. Yeah. Wow. I'm like, I'm, I'm really just, I could talk to you for hours, I think. I know, because, me too. We all could. Because I, yeah, because I'm just so intrigued by all this um, information that you're, you're explaining. I mean, I always knew that, that like, are the, we had this, spe like this colonial relationship with this, the South Korean military. Um, but I didn't know to what extent that was. Um, but, but could you tell us a little bit more about the formation of the North and the South uh, with the 38th parallel and the uh, legitimacy of, of either government? Definitely, yeah. I mean, I could talk about this for hours, to be honest. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, this, this actually ties to into, you know, what you mentioned about resources. Um, you know, I, I can't give you a, a, a great resource that proves just like, like that, that human rights don't, uh, I mean, human rights violations don't exist in North Korea. But right. what I think is a better resource, in my opinion, that might be more time consuming, but is definitely going to give you a better understanding of what's happening and what has happened in Korea is understanding from liberation from Japanese colonialism and on. So going off on that, after um, Japan surrendered and let, let's, we also have to keep in mind, Japan not only surrendered because of the atomic bombs, Japan surrendered before the atomic bombs because the Soviet Union started pushing down from Manchuria um, to, uh, from Manchuria to Korea. So, so Japan didn't not only, Japan didn't surrender purely because of the United States. Um, like the Nazis, the Soviet Union had to do a lot to do with um, the Japanese surrender. And when the Soviet Union um, came into Korea and Japan went back. Uh, by that point, uh, the Soviet Union and the US had an agreement called joint trusteeship, a uh, trusteeship to peacefully um, co-supervise, uh, I guess that's the word, um, the Korean Peninsula. Now that already sounds ridiculous because Korea has been an autonomous country for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Um, and Koreans didn't need any, you know, uh, any you know, tutelage or anything like that. But right. um, uh, it was supposed to be a peaceful um, co cooperation between the Soviet Union and the United States. But the United States militarized the 38th parallel um, without the Soviet Union's permission to see if the Soviet Union would do anything. So it was really a test. Uh, they would see if, okay, would the Soviet Union do anything if we militarize this border? And the Soviet Union didn't respond violently. So the United States was like, all right, I guess we get to kind of keep South Korea now. And so um, by that point, the Korean people have already made these things called people's committees. And these were 
um, segregated by provinces. So, you know, uh, one province, you know, would have people's committees and these would be, this would include local police, local, uh, local, you know, food distributing laws and everything like that. And they were connected and these were not all independent, I'm sorry, not independent, um, what's the word, individual unconnected committees. These were all connected by um, a, a organization that was supposed to connect the entire country together. And one of the leaders for this movement was Kim Il-sung. And so when the U.S. came to the South, they saw people's committees as a communist threat because obviously to the United States, any power in the hands of the people is bad, right? It's communist, it's bad. Mm -hmm. And so which is why the Cheju massacre happened because the Cheju, uh, Cheju people's committees was arguably the strongest and the most concrete people's committees in um, the southern half of the country. This is an US island, right? It's, it's away from the mainland, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the most southern, I guess, region in the, in the entire peninsula. And of course, the U.S. could not have that. And so General Hodge, John Hodge, was the, um, the uh, general in, um, watching over uh, the U.S. military in Korea, called it a war on communism and declared war on the uh, uh, residents or anyone really just trying to get any sense of self-determination in the South. And so long story short, in the South, any uh, sign of South Korean self, um, Korean uh, self-determination was wiped out and replaced with um, a government made up of collaborators. And by collaborators, I mean rich landowners that benefited off of Japanese colonialism, made money with the Japanese at the expense of Korean blood. These men were reinstated and the uh, uh, in the colonial police apparatus was also reinstated and still continues to this day, KCIA, right, of course. Um, and whereas in the North, um, there was automatically a Korean government. The difference was in the South, there was no Korean government. It was a U.S. military uh, military government, uh, USMG, I, think, I, I believe it was called. And in, in the North, under it was under Soviet supervision, but no Soviet of, uh, official actually held any positions. It was all held by Korean men and women. And, and people's committees, like I mentioned before, were utilized. They were brought in, they were structured, and they were recognized, and they were connected all under the Northern system, uh, in a socialist system. So that already set the precedent of what's going to happen in the next decades, where in the North, we already see movements of a people's movements um, making the way for their own self-determination. Whereas in the South, any, any effort to make self-determination was shot down, literally, and replaced with a military government and South Korean dictatorship made of rich land, uh, landowners. And so when you follow that trend and, you know, uh, fast forward five years, we had the Korean War, which uh, the popular narrative says that the North invaded on June 25th. Um, the Korean War in the South is referred to as 625, um, it's June 25th. But border fighting actually started in 1949, not 1950. And that was when um, South Korean forces were under operational control of the US. So when North Korea says that the war wasn't started by you know, us, it was, it was ignited by the US, it's really not far from the truth at all because the US had no place being in Korea. Um, How do you invade your own country? Hmm? Exactly, right. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. How does, and, and you know, when you think about the US Civil War, who ever questions who shot first, right? Like, I mean, right. South, North, and does it matter who shot first? If, if it's a civil war, you know, it, like, it, in the words of Bruce Cummings, um, civil wars you know, come, right? They just, they happen. They, they don't, it's not like nothing happening, and then all of a sudden someone shoots a gun, and then now it's a war, right? It, it, that's not how it happens. It brews up over time. And the flame that, brewed this war was the U.S. occupation. And yeah, um, um, and the Korean War is a whole other topic, but I mean, I'll stop here for this question. But yeah, um, the uh, emerging states, uh, the emerging two states was so different. In the South, not independent at all, uh, dominated by US mil the U.S. military officials and um, rich collaborators. And in the North, it was by people who actually fought um, the Japanese with um, as guerrillas, like Kim Il-sung himself, and um, all his um, political comrades were also his 
actual comrades in the battlefield. Mm. And these were people that actually proved um, a track record of fighting uh, imperialists at the expense of their own blood. You know, it's a, a completely different leadership, uh, even from the beginning. This was this was really fun. This was really good. Yeah. Can you repeat the title of your YouTube channel one more time, just for, mm -hmm. for folks to reference? Messy Room New Sesh. That's awesome. Holy. We're, 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 all, we're also subscribed, too. We're going to subscribe. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to uh, this week's episode of The Red Lettuce. I'm one of your co-hosts, Ryan, uh, joined by Fox and Eric, and our guest, David Yoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thanks so much, guys.